cloud. Okay, I think, I think we're recording and we're also on Facebook Live. Um, hi everybody, my name is Caitlin Simosi Belknap. I am Move to Men's National Director. I'm um, talking to you from Sacramento, California. And we're really hi. excited about this um, webinar. Hi everybody, oh. my name is Caitlin Simosi uh -oh, uh -oh. Belknap. I am Move to Men's National Director. And that's the Facebook Live. Okay. Goes better. <laughs> now we know we're testing something out. <laughs> so folks are coming in. Um, I'm just gonna uh, be running the um, background. So um, if folks have questions or um, issues, you can chat them to us on the bottom right. Um, that's also where when you have uh, questions, you can chat your questions in the chat, but you can also use this Q&A function at the bottom, which is kind of better. Um, but if that stresses you out and the chat's right there, either way, when you see a place to type, you can type, type your question and we'll break at a couple different points and, um, and uh, hear from you. And then the other thing that we're just um, asking everyone to think about right now is as we're going through this, we want to see how to continue this conversation and um and and where else we should go with this next so um if you could be thinking about uh what more besides what we're talking about today would be helpful to you in the evaluation at the end that's one of the things that we'd love to hear from you so where it says more comments um that's the kind of thing that we'd love to hear if if you'd like any additional follow-up so i'm going to turn it over to uh jasmine to get us started thank you so much Hey everybody, my name is Jasmine. Um, so before I go deeply into introductions, I just wanna lay out the goal. The goal of this webinar is to give activists who are already involved in the 20th Amendment or involved more generally in pro-democracy, social justice movements, tools to make the movements more intersectional and inclusive. And we're gonna do that by focusing on connecting with, learning from, supporting and building with communities that have been marginalized by systems of oppression. So we're just going to give general tips throughout this whole process. Uh, it's not at all inclusive of all the tools that exist for this purpose. Um, but since we're packing in a lot today, we're not going to have time to give everything the time that it deserves. Um, so we're going to be sending an email following up to this, e this, um, this whole conversation. And we're just going to lay out some more information about the topics that we covered. And even still, we might be over a little bit of time um, so if folks need to leave, don't worry because we're recording this and we will send it to you in the email as well. Um, so I'm really excited. The presenters on this call are wonderful and they'll have really great insight to intersectional and anti-oppression based organizing. And all the folks have you know, created content that approaches issues with this lens. Um, so just starting off, my name is Jasmine Gomez. I use she, her, hers pronouns or they, them, their pronouns. I work with Free Speech for People. Um, so Free Speech for People is an organization that formed on the eve of Citizens United and it, worked towards, it works towards promoting political equality and anti-corruption efforts through amendment advocacy, legal advocacy, and political advocacy. So I specifically work as an attorney and the Democracy Honors Fellow and I work towards passing in the constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics and end corporate rule. So I want to talk a little bit, the reason I wanted to pioneer this conversation is when I came into this space, I realized that in addition to there not being a lot of people that look like me in the community, queer, femme, people of color, but also a lot of the conversation around the amendment seemed to miss how our democracy and issues around political and economic inequality interrelate with other systems of oppression things like patriarchy, heteronormativity, white supremacy. And these are terms we're gonna learn a little bit more in a little bit, so don't worry if you don't really know what I'm talking about just yet. Um, but for me, talking about money and politics and corporate personhood without also talking about systems of oppression misses the forest from the trees. Um, so in reality, the people who are often experience the most harm from money and politics and corporate oppression are people who have been marginalized by other systems of oppression. And we're going to learn more about that on this call today. So it's therefore necessary that we connect with and organize with these communities so that we can get their invaluable insight on how to solve some of these issues. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who's going to introduce herself, and then we're going to go ahead through and introduce all of the panelists who will be on the call. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, my name is Jessica Munger. I am Move to Amends Program Director, um, and I'm calling today from my home in Los Angeles, where it is way too warm. 
Um, and thank you so much to everyone for being here and having this conversation. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, and thank you for reminding me of that, Jasmine. Um, so the title of this webinar set, of which this is the second uh, call, is Inclusivity and Intersectionality in the Pro-Democracy Movement. So what we're referring to here is the movement for the 28th Amendment and the larger democracy movement. Um, the 28th Amendment is an effort to address corporate rule and the influence of money in politics through a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So there are different approaches to the depth and breadth of the amendment. Um, move to Amend's proposed amendment, which is the We the People Amendment, currently HJR 48, abolishes both the illegitimate court-created doctrines of corporate constitutional rights and money as speech, um, which work together to perpetuate corporate rule. Um, there are different groups who are working towards the 28th Amendment, but through slightly different strategies. So Move to Amend's mission includes the 28th Amendment as a tactic in realizing a just and democratic society, which we don't believe we've ever had since the founding of the United States on this land. Um, we know that the solution must be bold and systemic, and we know that it will take a broad, deep people's movement to make such revolutionary change. So we dedicate a lot of our work to grassroots movement building, which we believe is rooted in anti-oppression and solidarity organizing, um, which really necessitates an intersectional analysis. Um, so we have tons of educational materials, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but if you go to movetoamend.org, you can find tons of information about the amendment movement and what true democracy could look like if we are building with an intersectional analysis. Um, so some of you might not be directly in the amendment movement yourself, um, but the skills and insight provided today, I think are easily transferable to any work in the movement for liberation, justice, equity, and um, all the other good stuff we work for. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. So we're going to go ahead and introduce the other panelists who are on the call as well. Um, so David, we'll start with you from the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Yes, uh, good evening or afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Jasmine said, my name is David Harris. I'm from Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at Harvard Law School. It's an organization that was founded in 2005 by Professor Charles Ogletree to extend the legacy of Charles Hamilton Houston, who, for those of you who don't know, was the architect of Brown versus Board of Education and uh, the, the kind of the trainer of a whole generation of civil rights lawyers. We take a couple of things from Houston in our work. Uh, one is his edict that uh, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite. Uh, we choose to seek to, to create social engineers. And the other and more important and relevant to what we're doing today is that he noted for us that despite the fact that he did his work on education and some labor, he recognized even as he won uh, his victory that we would not uh, end all problems with that. And he warned us that all our struggles must tie in together. And it's, a, it's, a, it's really a kind of uh, a mantra that we maintain in our work uh, that our, our, our work cannot be done in isolation either uh, by subject matter or by constituents of the, 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 the kind of infinite number of people who are marginalized and excluded in our society historically and today. So, and we have a, a major project that we call Community Justice that I'll talk a little bit about later. Thank you. Thank you. I use uh, he and him. Thank you. Appreciate that. Iraq, do you want to go ahead? Word. Um, peace, everybody. Uh, Iraq, Arroyo Montano. And um, in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, originally named Shamit by the Wampanoag uh, people here, uh, representing a national grassroots organization named United for a Fair Economy. And my role there is uh, the director of cultural organizing, and I'm a popular educator there as well. Um, I use he, him, totally okay with they, them, uh, proud uh, queer Boricua uh, who was born and raised here in Boston in the 80s, which was kind of the coming right out of the Garrity ruling and colliding uh, race in, in a very strong way. So that informs me. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm happy to have you. Michelle from the Massachusetts Trans Political Coalition. Hi, everyone. Glad to be on the call tonight. Uh, my name is Michelle. I go by she and her. Um, as Jasmine said, I am, I'm a board member on the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. Um, I identify as a trans femme individual, queer person of color, East Asian descent. Um, and uh, just to tell y'all a little bit about uh, MTPC, uh, we're an organization that was founded in 2001 
uh, to essentially advocate for our trans community here in terms of uh, housing, employment, medical access, um, anything that deal anything that deals with the whole political umbrella we advocate for. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been involved most recently in our fight for public accommodations here in the state. Uh, and the most recent thing that we're trying to trying to defend as uh, public accommodations in Massachusetts for trans people. We recently passed it in 2017 and now it's on a ballot measure to for repeal already. So, you know, the fight continues. Thank you so much, Michelle. And last but not least, please, George. Hi there. I'm George Friday. I'm a founding board member of Move to Amend, a native North Carolinian, and a lifelong fighter for real democracy, which as I believe Jessica said at the top of the call, we have never had. So glad to be here tonight, honored to be among this great crew of people for the webinar, and I'll own being the elder on the call, which takes some maturity on my part. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I hear you, David. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm just Thank you all. Um, so just to give a layout, so for folks listening to the call, um, the next step that we're going to kind of dive into is a conversation on what is intersectionality and what is anti-oppression work. And then we're going to talk a little bit more as to why intersectionality and anti-oppression work are important both in general and to our specific amendment movement, the pro-democracy movement. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some tools that we have to become more intersectional within our organizing. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Caitlin to ask you all a question before we move forward. And I forgot to say that I use um, she and her pronouns. So um, we would love to know why, what you brought you here, what, you're, what you came for, and what you're hoping to learn. So if you could, in the chat, um, just share that with us, and um, I will read some of the answers uh, so that we have a sense of who's here. So just, again, what brought you to this webinar? What made you interested in this topic? And what you're, something that you're hoping to get out of it? Um, so I'll give you a minute to type. And then I'll let folks know what some of you might be able to see some of the answers, but just in case I'll, I'll read some of them out. <clears throat> Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I can't see this full name, but someone whose name starts with LUT says that they're here to roll back Citizens United. An Admiral cause. Anybody else want to tell us? Um, let's see. Lydia says she's here to learn about solidarity organizing. Travis says, I came to learn how to broaden my base of support for an amendment at the urging of a Lenape woman. Um, Joan, maybe, says to get more inclusive. Um, Greg says to create an authentic democracy movement that's inclusive and powerful. Um, anyone else want to let us know? I think I've got everybody. Oh, Richard says, I'm committed to coalition building. I want to learn the breadth of intersectionality. Anyone else? Oh. Clayton says to change the system so that our representatives actually represent us. Um, Lorraine says, I want to help people see how their concerns intersect with people they don't know or like. Henry says, reconnecting as a formal move to amend, former move to amend local. Okay, yay, Henry, I recognize your name. That's great. Um, Susan says, just to learn more about move to amend and um, organizing. Uh, Barbara says, I've been with move to amend. Broward from the beginning, moved to Pennsylvania, always looking to learn more. Another Barbara says, hoping to get better understanding of how corporate personhood affects all peoples and groups. I'm here to find ways to build greater coalitions with people of color in the segregated South. Michael says, interested in US democracy and how it is impacting our racist trajectory and how that might change. Um, another Michael says, to find out how Move to Amend and Free Speech for People are working together. 
Deborah says, I've gotten involved with our local democratic committee and through this organization was introduced to Move to Amend. I want to learn to how to effectively share the message. Peter says, how can the indivisibles help in this endeavor? And Richard says, how to help candidates, candidates to get out of their feel safe boxes. And um, I think that's everybody, if folks wanna, if you didn't get a chance to type it in, you, you can, all of the presenters um, will get a chance to see uh, these comments at the end. Um, we'll share it with everybody. So if there's anything else you wanna say to the presenters about why you're here, feel free to type it in, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Jasmine and thank you all for being here. These are great reasons. Thank you all. So, wow, that's wonderful. There's a lot of different reasons people are here and I'm really great to get that feedback. I also wanna acknowledge that there's 70 people on the webinar right now. So thank you all for joining. Um, I'm really excited that so many people want to learn about this topic and wanna to learn how we can move forward together. So we're gonna dive right in to what is intersectionality. And then Jessica is gonna give us some examples of some of the language that we might come across in the conversations that we're gonna have moving forward. So to start, critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw coined that term intersectionality, and she did it to refer to overlapping and intersecting social identities, things like class, race, and gender, and also the related systems of oppression that go along with those identities. So racism, sexism, heteronormativity, et cetera. So people who live, the idea is that people who live with multiple intersecting social identities tend to experience multiple systems of oppression. So their perspective and their experiences tend to be different than people with fewer of those um, subordinated intersecting identities. So an example is myself. I'm queer, I'm Puerto Rican, woman. I have a lot of student debt. I grew up low income. So my perspective is likely to be very different from people who don't have those identity features because I've had to deal with things in my life such as racism, homophobia, classism, and sexism. So I don't also, you know, recognizing the complexity of my own identity, have to deal with oppression right now around physical ability or discrimination based on religion, like Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. And so every person has their own individual identity and every person should think about their own complexities, their privileges and, and some of the oppression that they might face. To kind of give a little bit more of an in-depth perspective, I want to play a video. So I'm going to screen share for you all. Today we hear the call for full equality for women and distinctly for women of color from a multiplicity of perspectives. Intersectionality is a term we often hear, but what does it mean? Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in 1989, explains it with a metaphor. Consider an intersection made up of many roads. The roads are the structures of race, gender, gender identity, class, sexuality, disability. And the traffic running through those roads are the practices and policies that discriminate against people. Now, if an accident happens, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. So if a black woman is harmed because she is in an intersection, her injury could result from discrimination from any or all directions. Intersectionality in all discussions of the rights of African American women today is built on the work of previous generations who have always been a part of the fight for full equality. So that was just a little bit more context and insight on just the term intersectionality and where it comes from. And so I'll go and pass it over to Jessica. Sure, thanks for that um, kickoff. I like that video a lot. Um, so before we dig in, I just want to go over a few very basic definitions that you might hear on this call so that we're starting with a shared language um, about words which relate to systemic oppression and intersectionality. Um, so we can offer further definitions and explanations of these terms in the follow-up email that we'll send you um, because this list is by no means exhaustive, um, nor am I an expert of any kind. So um, the first term is systemic oppression. That refers to systems that unjustly keep communities in hardship, inequity, and harm, and are perpetuated by laws, policies, and systems. 
The second term is racism, it refers to discrimination plus power with regards to race. So that's what the power piece is what's important to understand the distinction between racism and discrimination. Um, this combination leads to the perpetuation of racial inequality and further disenfranchisement of those people without systemic power. Um, so many, excuse me, many of the laws that protect racism and systemic oppression are strengthened by corporate power and money in politics. So Move to Amend has a short 30 minute documentary if you're curious about um, how some of these laws were codified. Uh, it's called Legalized Democracy and it's free to stream on YouTube. Um, I'd highly recommend checking it out and we'll include it also in the follow up email. Um, the next term is heteronormativity. Uh, which relates to a worldview that promotes heterosexuality as a normal or preferred sexual orientation and punishes those who do not fit that expectation. Related is patriarchy, a system of society, culture, and government in which men hold and maintain power at the detriment of women and non-binary people and promotes violence against them. The next term is cis or cisgender, which is a term used to describe individuals who for the most part identify as the gender they were assigned at birth by their doctor and by society. Um, and then there's trans or transgender, an umbrella term used to refer to a person whose identity and gender is different than what was assigned to them at birth. Um, it's important to note that for Western English centric people, we often describe these individuals as trans, transgender, non-binary, or gender non-conforming. It's also important to understand that cultures around the world historically have their own languages in understanding this diverse, um, complex world of gender identity and gender roles. Um, the next word is transphobia, uh, which is oppressing, discriminating against people for being trans or non-binary. Um, the next word is cisnormativity. Um, the assumption that all or most all individuals are cisgender and at best cisnormativity contributes to the erasure of trans and non-binary people and experiences and at worst it is part of a deliberate and calculated system of oppression that institutionalizes sexism and transphobia. Um, so there of course are many more terms and nuances about these terms presented here which like I said will include in the resources as a follow-up email to this um, and you can um, dig a lot further into those if you wish. Thanks for the opportunity to to do that. Thank you so much. Um, so now that we have a little bit of a basis and background as to what intersectionality is and some of the language around it, um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to move into why are intersectional and anti-oppression frameworks important. So we're going to start with David. And David, I just want to hear a little bit from you why is it important to bring an intersectional and anti-oppression framework to the work that we do generally? So, I, you know, I think I, I kind of uh, gave it away earlier when I talked about Charles Hamilton Houston kind of calling on us that all our struggles have to tie in together. I think uh, from, from our perspective at the Houston Institute, uh, American society is really based on a history of exclusion. And, and I think uh, that, 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 that this propensity for exclusion is in the, the country's DNA. And, and therefore, you know, it, it, in virtually everything we do, we, we have to kind of struggle uh, in, in order to overcome that exclusion and create uh, alternative pathways to inclusion. And uh, that means kind of being aware of and, and, and sensitive to the really myriad uh, uh, ways in which oppression uh, kind of uh, occurs in our society. As a, as a routine, as a kind of routine matter. Thank you. Um, I actually want to share a quote from Audre Lorde that I think also gives an, an example as to why intersectionality as a whole is important. The quote is as follows. I am a lesbian woman of color whose children eat regularly because I work in a university. If their full bellies make me fail to realize my commonality with a woman of color whose children do not eat because she cannot find work or who has no children because her insides are rotted from home abortions and sterilization. If I fail to recognize the lesbian who chooses not to have children, the woman who remains closeted because her homophobic community is her only life support, the woman who chooses silence instead of another death, the woman who is terrified, least my anger trigger the explosion of hers. If I fail to recognize them as other faces of myself, 
then I am contributing not only to each of their oppressions, but also to my own. And the anger which stands between us then must be used for clarity and mutual empowerment, not for invasion by guilt or further separation. I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And I am not free as long as one person of color remains chained, nor is any one of you. So Audre Lorde, um, very famous, beautiful black writer. Um, I wanna dive now into why intersectionality is important specifically to the amendment movement. And in order to do this, I'm gonna bring in some of the other panelists to explore this topic. So some of the panelists are gonna give folks insight to the history and also the current knowledge on how systems of oppression in the United States operate and how they've been operating. And then Jessica and I, we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about people who experience um, these systems of oppression are hit even harder by the impacts of money and politics, corporate rights, and corporate dominance and political inequality today. So we're gonna start over and bring it to David because David has to leave early. Um, so I wanna just go ahead and ask David uh, if you could just give a little bit of uh, history about political and racial inequality in the US. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I'd like to start by saying, uh, you know, I just came from an event we did here at the law school where we showed a film called Tribal Justice, which is a remarkable film, and it's a depiction of two uh, Native American uh, tribal judges. Uh, and, uh, and it's important that I open with this because uh, we, we had a couple of students there, and, and one of the students began by insisting that we all recognize and acknowledge the land that we stand on uh, is not our own. And Iraq, I appreciate, you know, kind of your, your shout to that as well. And I think, you know, it reminded me really very much and very actively about, uh, uh, about how important it is for us to acknowledge and be part of other people's uh, struggles. Uh, so, you know, I, I, and I think, I, I, as I said earlier, there is this history of exclusion. It's, you know, we are an institute for race and justice. We look largely at, uh, at, 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 at racial oppression. Uh, and uh, a lot of our work uh, is centered around understanding this history. Uh, and, you know, for those of us who, who think about it, the, the history of oppression is, is comprehensive. And, and uh, we, we live in a society by which uh, systems of social control are imposed upon uh, different communities, and we understand those from our perspective in dealing with race and African Americans uh, coming out of a history and a legacy of slavery. And, you know, so that if we think about, for instance, policing today, it's not possible to think about policing without understanding the history of slave captures, the history of the way in which laws were enforced differentially uh, against black people by white people. Uh, and the ways in which, you know, I, I'll talk about this specifically, but the ways in which our society not only imposes its will on black people and, and people of color, but it favors whites. And we have a system uh, 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 in this country that, that does that historically and continues to do that. There are myriad examples of it uh, uh, through history, uh, and, and there are, in fact, linkages. So, you know, one of the linkages that, that, that we see and troubles us greatly is there, there is a relationship between today's uh, 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 kind of attempt or effort to get local jurisdictions uh, to uh, kind of act as uh, agents of ICE and the Fugitive Slave Act, which, the fact which, which, which was doing the same thing uh, following the, one of the first uh, clauses of the Constitution was the Fugitive Slave Act, which required states to return slaves who had escaped to, back to the South. And, you know, and, 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 and the battle between the states and the feds was very similar. So that these, these struggles are, are kind of constant uh, in our history. Uh, our own work, uh, again, looks at, we, we've done a lot of work around the question of the death penalty, for instance, and the death penalty in this country, which is at the, the kind of apex of our so-called justice system, but really is our criminal enforcement system. Uh, we think of it as racialized. Well, it's racialized in two important ways. One way is that, uh, uh, you know, it disproportionately affects black people, but the more important and significant way is that the greatest predictor of whether we use the death penalty is the race of victim. So the, so the death penalty is used largely to vindicate the rights of white victims, and which isn't to say that, 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 that we shouldn't be uh, concerned or sensitive to, to, to those things. But the fact is that we spend a huge amount of money vindicating those rights of, of, of white victims 
while entire communities of color and other marginalized people are totally underserved and their voices are, are, are greatly diminished. Uh, and so we, we actually start with the question of what kind of society are we that chooses to operate that way, right? And uh, that chooses to value the lives of a small number of whites over communities of color. Uh, and there are lots of answers. I'm sure each person on this call, on this webinar, has an answer to that one, you know, one simple answer is that it's an unjust society. But we also look to the fact that, the, that it's also what I would call grammatical fiction, right? So we don't make these decisions, right? And that's the great lie, right? So just as much as we the people is a falsehood, so is the notion that we as a, as a society are making these choices. These choices are being made by us, by those who have access, by those who have power, and those who have influence. And uh, you know, it, it, it really is a, a kind of common effort, I think, that all of us on this call kind of, you know, have to kind of recognize the need to think about ways in which we can reverse that power dynamic and, uh, and, and create opportunities for those who have been excluded to have greater voice in determining the courses of their uh, affairs. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, so we're going to pass it along to Iraq, who's going to talk a little bit about the history of economic and racial inequality and how those are linked in the United States as well. Word. Thank you. Um, first thing I'm going to do is, is put a little quick link in the chat there. Um, and that is a reference to, to a report that uh, United for a Fair Economy puts out uh, every year. And, and the, I'm looking at 2017 and it's called Morning in America. And in there, uh, there's conversations about intersectionality um, and, and there's specific empirical data. So folks who are looking for the statistics, et cetera, I'm not going to go off on those in five minutes, uh, but they're there. And, and, and one of the things that we use, uh, United for a Fair Economy, one of our uh, more popular uh, uh, trainings is around the racial wealth divide. And it's uh, called Healing the Racial Wealth Divide. And it's a training of the trainers and it brings people from different sections of the country together and you can hear the kind of anecdotal stories of ways people are being affected and we speak to these things. One of the things that we know we cannot do is we cannot speak about, uh, well we could but we would be misleading folks if we spoke about uh, the economic injustice without making the connection to gender and race. And we know for a, a fact that these things not only play a role, empirically and anecdotally, we, we have folks who, whose experiences are um, literally, um, are literally a function of policies and, and, and legislation that has exploited people over and over again, in particular dark folks, in particular women, in particular uh, uh, black people in America, and then on and on and on it goes. And we have the numbers. So one of the ways that I like to explain intersectionality to people is a lot of folks are familiar, some are familiar with uh, the Equal Pay for Men and Women Act. And, and often when that number goes out, folks will say for every dollar, uh, women make 76 cents. And what we do when, when we're having that conversation is we're talking about uh, white men and white women. And so intersectionality says we need to look at more than that, right? So when you start to look at more than that, uh, you see that uh, black and brown or Latinx uh, uh, women are making uh, 50 cents to that dollar that uh, Latinx and black men uh, are making uh, slightly more than them at 56, 58. And those statistics do not use black and brown men that are incarcerated in their statistics. So we know that these numbers even are even worse than we've gotten them. And we've seen over and over how um, the legislation like the new tax uh, uh, deal, uh, austerity measures, the things that our country has pushed uh, and, and put policies into the world. And then me, I'm a product of colonization. My island uh, was recently in the news, and occasionally we get a little bit of news now. Uh, the island of Puerto Rico, or Boriquen, uh, as the Taino folks called it, is a colony of the United States, and there is no uh, further proof. I, I wish I was wrong um, all of the years that I was kind of yelling and screaming and saying, hey, we're a colony. Uh, I, wish I, can, I wish I could have been proven wrong by the recent event. Uh, 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 of the disaster, but what it did was it showed right away uh, financially if we're not making money uh, off of this situation, which, whether it's a, a disaster uh, exploitation uh, or looking at folks there and figuring out where is the dollar being, being made and making legislation in order for the dollar to be made. And more often than not, what folks have not connected specifically, I don't think, are the ways that 
uh, policies in the beginning of the American experiment of the colonies and the creation of, of this nation uh, with whom uh, Bell Hooks made very clear uh, was this three-headed monster of, of patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Uh, the way that legislation was created by land-owning uh, uh, white men, uh, and then over time, folks fought to kind of be at this, this, this table. And I know a lot of folks here are, are interested in kind of the democracy and creating that intersectionality. Um, random rant uh, from, from a Puerto Rican dude is I saw a photo of Demita Frazier in the video that Jasmine played. And Demita is one of our elders here in Boston and one of the founders of the Kambahi Women's Collective. In the 70s, they were uh, essentially, if you read them, they were speaking about intersectionality. Uh, and so over and over, you see that this is something that folks were having conversations about. And then Kimberly Crench uh, came and, and made sure that folks were like, we're going to talk about this and we'll name it. And now as we start to see, even the fall in, in 2008, when we saw that our, our um, country had this economic crisis in that moment, folks who were truly, truly being affected were people who were catching these predatory loans, right? People were, were getting, and, and that was disproportionately black and brown folks who were then having their homes taken from them. Um, and so this kind of creation of uh, uh, the, uh, this kind of, you know, deflation or understanding that this American uh, dream that had been created for the picket fence uh, out of this uh, FDR policy didn't include everyone. And it certainly didn't include uh, black and brown folks. And uh, when I look at intersectionality and economics, I'm con constantly being able to show people, and this is why that link you have is there, this, this timeline, it's called the boost in blocks to building wealth. And in it, you'll see over, I'll, I'll choose Jim Crow laws, uh, you know, these are some of them, I, I, you know, the, the New Deal and who was getting, who was able to get benefit from the GI Bill. Um, in Puerto Rico, for example, uh, we, were, we were in a position where our island was not allowed to trade because we're a colony with any other country economically and all of our purchases have to come from the United States. So what happens is that this small island is the fourth largest nation consumer of American products. So the money isn't, so this is one of these ways that we continue to make the money off of people and on people, uh, people's backs. Every time that the money uh, is hurting, we know for fact that, that you know, the people that uh, are being blamed are those folks who are, in, are, are now in need. And that's one thing I think I'll end kind of thinking about that in my mind is that we have to challenge this, this, this falsehood, this notion that poverty is someone's fault. And, and if we are going to look at it fault, we're going to look at who created the legislation to be to put people at fault, but that those people whose uh, pockets are hurting, who know that poverty is one of the worst forms of violence, who suffer in trying to um, survive, are, are, not, are now created with this kind of American exceptionalism, with these myths that we've created, are not allowed to, to break these barriers and conversations, and we're seeing that that's changing now. So that excites me. And so, I, I, you know, you can give credit to movements of folks. I know United for a Fair Economy worked with a then mayor in uh, Burlington, Vermont, Bernie Sanders, to talk about uh, uh, numbers and to talk about the statistics that we had and that we were providing in that moment. And I actually want to end with a quote to uh, Jasmine. I love that you brought the quote in. I'm going to go with Arundhati Roy because my thing is when we have these conversations, I really, I really don't want people to walk away being like, well, there's nothing we can do then. I really want people to think about what, what is it that we can do and how do, we, how do we tap into that? So let me go ahead and read that. And that's in the thing that I, that I uh, let you all uh, get a uh, click to. And United for Fair Economy, by the way, has, we're, we're committed to offering resources on our website and feel free to follow up with me and, and folks on the, on the website about the training and the work, et cetera. So Arundhati Roy says our strategy should not only be to confront empire, but to lay siege to it and to deprive it of oxygen and to shame it, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. And on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. Now we're going to pass it over to Michelle, who's going to talk a little bit about economic inequality potentially within the queer and trans community and also explaining how corporate rights um, and money and politics affects the queer and trans community. 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I, I will just say when I, before I list all the little facts that I have written down here um, that most of the challenges that my community faces is directly tied to economics in one way or another. So as I'm listing things that might not sound economic, but it definitely goes back to the economics of my community. So I think one of the most pertinent um, tangible things uh, that people can relate to, but also something that in my community is of utmost importance is access to healthcare. Um, so the vast majority, uh, I won't say, say the vast majority, but many trans folks seek healthcare for one for, in one form or another, uh, whether it's access to hormones or getting surgery or anything like that. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is the vast majority of us, we pay out of pocket uh, to access uh, healthcare. Um, most of the time, um, in insurers are not required to uh, necessarily provide trans or cover trans-related health care. Um, here in Massachusetts, there's, some, there's policy, uh, at least for uh, um, insurance policies under our uh, Massachusetts Health Connector, to provide uh, trans-inclusive health care uh, to trans people in Massachusetts. Um, and even, even though that's the case here in Massachusetts, uh, you can think of uh, uh, cases like Hobby Lobby, for example, of uh, using religious rights to sort of uh, protect their, their, or to basically deny health care for specific reasons. So in Hobby Lobby, they didn't want to provide uh, uh, health care for birth, uh, birth control. Um, corporations and companies can still do the same thing for trans and LGBTQ related, related health care. So that's always still a threat for us. Um, but uh, uh, with that even being said, most of us aren't even re really receiving adequate health care to begin with. Um, you know, and aside from like, like downstream capitalist economics, like uh, with many of the intersecting communities that I do work with and that I identify with, um, we, we are under fire uh, by policies directly from um, our administration, um, which have again related to economics, but you know, like they're just getting straight, they're just literally just attacking our lives in general. So like most recently, um, we saw the Department of Health and Human Services essentially uh, create an office to protect religious rights of healthcare providers, um, which is a thinly veiled uh, sort of uh, reason to allow providers um, to discriminate against, against LGBTQ folks. Um, we see uh, policies, for example, where uh, the current administration does, uh, has revoked guidance to protect trans kids in schools um, for no better reason other than to, quote unquote, like protect the safety of kids in school, other kids in schools. Um, uh, and, and there was an Obama era policy that did protect trans kids in schools, so they revoked that. Uh, and then we see like thing, uh, like the Justice Department um, essentially interpret uh, federal law in a way that, that where they say that federal law does not protect gender identity in workplace, um, both in terms of workplace, uh, if you are working at a specific workplace or if uh, you are applying to be employed uh, in a workplace. So they just won't protect, protect trans people um, uh, in those domains. Um, and, and, and frankly, all these issues um, and with healthcare, with policy decisions, um, is just indicative of larger systemic intersectional issues um, that cross lines between my identity and, and other identities that I share within my community. So, so there's not a whole lot of hard data uh, in the trans community, and that's just because it's it's uh, you know it's sort of hard to track us down because we don't ha we're not we're trying to stay alive for the most part. Um, uh, you can find most of the statistics that I'm going to cite if, on the website for the National Center of Transgender Equality. They do a lot of amazing work um, in trying to like really understand some of the challenges that our community faces. Uh, but here, here are some statistics uh, that uh, might be important for you to know. So, um, you know, about you know one third of trans folks um, uh, who are able to even be surveyed um, are report being in poverty, essentially. Um, and if you are a person of color, a trans person of color, you're basically at uh, the, the population is about 40% in poverty. Um, so you can see, you know, we know that people of color, especially 
like African Americans are more likely to essentially make less money. Um, if you're a queer, trans, African American, uh, you all those identities sort of magnify the type of discrimination that you face. Um, and uh, you know, this forty percent number is about three times the amount of what the general population faces. So you know, like it's it's not it like you don't hear this like by mainstream LGBT or Q or um, organizations um, uh, because t a lot of these organizations, I think of like HRC, Human Rights Campaign, for example, are led by white gay men. men. Um, so the statistics about people of color are usually, usually sort of hidden away and you have to really dig for it, uh, which is why I appreciate the NCTE's work. Um, and uh, about 25% of us experience some level of homelessness um, and again, this number actually doesn't take into account um, whether you're a person of color or not. There's no data on that actually, but one could imagine that number rises uh, quite a bit um, if you're also a person of color. Um, there are some other notes I want to mention to you that sort of highlight intersection, like my, the intersections of our community that we face. Um, uh, most likely, if you're familiar with uh, any sort of trans-related advocacy or politics, um, you might know that in 2017, there are 28 people reported murdered, trans people reported murdered in that year, um, eight this year or more already. Um, most of these people are people of color. Uh, most of these people are trans women. Um, and with those last two points highlighting that one, um, the intersections of, of uh, where heteronormativity uh, meets uh, being a person of color. Um, so violence against trans women is not some, anything new. Um, it has everything to do with toxic, the to toxic masculinity that we have um, in our culture. And again, we know that black and brown bodies are facing much more violence than white people are facing uh, just in general. Um, so when you put those two things together, you have this horrifying trend of trans women of color being murdered at a higher rate than most most other uh, groups of individuals. Um, uh, the second point uh, I want to make is that um, these days it's sort of hip to be trans, just like it was hip to be gay. Um, but I just want to highlight that uh, most of the visible trans people that you see um, are trans people who have an uh, extreme amount of economic privilege. Um, so like most recently we think of like the Caitlyn Jenners of the world. Um, you know, she, she's white, she has a lot of money. A lot of trans people who are who who get media airplay are much like her, um, with the one exception of uh, uh, being um, um, what's her name? I forgot her name already. Um, Jasmine knows who I, who, who who I'm talking about. Um, uh, Laverne. And, Laverne. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, you know, it's it's just sort of a shame that uh, there are qu quite a few trans uh, uh, POC leaders in our community, but you know, their voices are never really highlighted uh, for one reason or another. Uh, and, and lastly, I just wanna sort of end on sort of a historical note um, about the trans rights movement, um, really the LGBTQ rights movement um, in here in the, this country. Um, so the modern LGBTQ rights movement um, came out of uh, the Stonewall riots in New York City. Um, what, what history books don't necessarily tell the full story is, is that, um, that much of the Stonewall riots was, um, uh, was initiated by um, trans women of color back in the day. Uh, they were calling themselves queens back in the day, but in today's terminology, they were trans women. Um, and I think about trans women like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, who sort of pioneered a lot of uh, the modern LGBTQ rights movement, um, really up until the 1980s when um, sort of uh, the sort of mainstream um, assimilationist uh, gay rights movement sort of took over the narrative uh, with, you know, with all their capital that they had um, and sort of have largely controlled the narrative since uh, and uh, most of the organizations that you see that highlight uh, modern LGBTQ rights movements, like the Human Rights Campaign, they're largely run by gay men, white men who have come from background of money. Um, and those organizations tend to also, uh, you know, 
uh, get funded by white LGBTQ people. Um, so it perpetuates the system that m mostly silences both trans, uh, trans people, but also trans people of color. So uh, what can you do um, uh, after I've like thrown all these like factoids at you? Um, I really strongly suggest that um, if you're going to support our community, support organizations that do intersectional work. Um, a couple organizations that do national work that I can think of are, are uh, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project uh, is one organization I really uh, strongly recommend um, and the Trans Law Center, um, both on either coasts of the country. So if you're on the West Coast Trans Law Center, if you're on the East Coast, uh, Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a lot of great information, including the complexities of how we have intersecting identities even within the communities. So no community is all the same. Um, so it's, it's good to think about how complex our identities are. So I just kind of want to tie things together. Um, now that we have a little bit of an understanding, the panelists just explained how various communities have and still are um, being prevented from having equal access to social, economic, and political systems. So in addition to this, we also have more than four decades of Supreme Court decisions around corporate rights and political spending um, that, really, that really provide a lack of access to economic opportunities and promotes even more barriers for people of color or other people marginalized by systems of oppression to have access to our political systems. So I wanna talk a little bit about Demos. Demos is a think tank that does work around political economic inequality they actually issued a couple of reports that talks about how our big money political system actually perpetuates both the economic and racial inequality that exists in our society today. So recent research um, has demonstrated something that I think a lot of us inherently know, and that is wealthy people have a very different policy perspective than the general population. And the government is more sharply responsive to the preferences of the wealthy few rather than those of the average voters. So this is what in turn ends up sustaining massive economic inequality that exists today, including the racial wealth gap, um, despite the fact that the vast majority of the population wants to actually shift economic policies to make it more just and equitable. And again, I just want to um, share really quickly on the screen so folks can see um, some of these statistics. So right here, we can see that the wealthy, these are some of the policy preferences um, for economic policy of both the affluent versus the general population. And we can see how sharp some of these differences are. So when we even look at an economic policy like minimum wage being high enough so that no family with a full-time worker falls below the official poverty line, 78% of the general population agrees that we should have a minimum wage, that a full-time worker is working and therefore nobody falls into the poverty line, yet only 40% of wealthy favor that. And we can see in our country, um, there's not a lot of places that have passed minimum wages that um, have meet, met the minimum living wage. Uh, so again, most people already understand this inherently. Polls across the board have showed that around 75% of people already believe that the wealthy few have more of a say in politics than anybody else. Um, so this data just backs up things that we already know. Um, another thing that comes out of this report is a conversation around how it's harder for people of color to run for candidacy. So candidates of color are less likely to have the money to run in the first place, and they're less likely to know folks who have the money who can help them run. Um, so in general, folks of color are just less likely to run. But even when they do run, they raise less money and they're less likely to win. So then also I want to just highlight kind of tying this all together. And this is more information from Demos's reports. And just so folks know, um, I've actually uh, set up a website, freespeechforpeople.org backslash intersectionality. And it's going to have the content that we've got over today on that web page, um, as well as some more content that we're going over in the future and content in general. Um, and we're going to provide links to all of this information that we're providing. So I know it's a lot coming at you. But because of our nation's past and present exclusion of 
people of color, queer and trans folks, and so many other groups from accessing our economic systems, they, those folks now have less of an ability um, to have money to compete with corporations and the wealthy few and have their voices heard in our political system. Um, so another quote from Demos says that record corporate political spending on election campaigns and lobbying has amplified the political exclusion of people of color. And the policy outcomes resulting from this big money campaign finance system fails to address the needs of people of color and in some cases actively restricts program in racial equity, progress in racial equity in America. So again, just kind of tying in how we've heard from the panelists about this longstanding economic, political, um, social inequality that exists with all of these groups, and then combining that with the effects of our big money system that exists today, where we prioritize the views of the wealthy, um, we're hitting communities who have been marginalized already even harder with our big money systems. So I just want to pass it over to Jessica to tie together any loose ends. And then after that, we're going to um, open up for questions. Um, so some folks have been bringing in questions and our panelists are going to have um, an opportunity to respond to some of the questions. Um, and then our panelists might leave us as we move on to how to make um, the, the amendment more intersectional. But you don't have to if you all want to stay. <laughs> Thanks, Jasmine. And thanks so much, everybody, for your contributions. I, it's a really rich discussion. And I also really want to thank Michelle for bringing in um, one of my favorite topics, which is the co-optation of the LGBTQ movement. Um, we can talk for hours about that later. Um, so we know that all people and really all living things feel the effects of corporate rule. Um, however, we can begin to see through this generous insight that those who do not hold institutional and political power and those whose voices are historically silenced feel the effects of corporate rule most harshly. Um, those who are already disenfranchised by the effects of corporate capitalism are those who need to be heard most when we work to address these problems. And we can't continue to think that we can possibly have a full conversation about personhood and political power and democracy without addressing the ways some people are systematically harmed by the current system. Um, so these systems are particularly harmful for indigenous folks, black people, people of color in general, queer and trans people, and other communities who have been excluded from economic and political opportunity in the past. And if we don't talk about and address this, um, we will absolutely fail as a movement. We know that from history. Um, looking at many spaces and organizations in the get many out of politics and amendment movement, there's a lot of resistance to talking about this. Um, I think because it's not easy, um, but we're not really here for easy because we're trying to amend the constitution and build a movement and that's really hard. Um, and we're here for liberation and not for short term solutions. Um, so we study history and we know that the most successful movements in history to expand democracy have been multiracial, multi ethnic, cross class and intersectional. Um, so this conversation is really timely in the movement and really important um, and thank you all so much for your lending your insight to this um, and this conversation won't stop we're, we're dedicated to taking this even further and um, really applying this to, to action so um, thank you all so much for sticking with us and I hope that we've um, you know shown you some of these these things in concrete examples. Thank you. Caitlin, you want to go ahead and answer some of the questions that we got from the audience, or ask rather? <laughs> have, um, some questions that folks have asked. So David said, and, and, and for others who have questions, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom and type in your question. Um, so David says, I'm concerned about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. As you probably know, while only 2% of Americans are Jews, but well over 50% of all religious-based hate crimes are crimes against Jews. How do we form alliances with the oppressed groups of Jews and Zionists? Anyone want to answer that? I don't know if I have an answer, but I have a response. And it has to do with recognizing the experiences of all communities dealing with oppression, whether that's based on your sexual identity, your faith, your class, your race, 
or your education background or physical ability. I say that because I want to underscore that there is not a hierarchy of oppression. It's really important to understand that because we can be in settings where people feel like, well, you're a low income person, but I'm queer and disabled and black, so shut up. That's not anyone's intention, never anyone's intention, but we live in a culture that encourages us to find conflict with each other, to find cause not to build power with each other. So if anything even starts to feel like it's going there, I have conditioned myself over many decades of discipline to resist that, to find how do I build with that person. So if I'm truly seeking democracy and authentic relationship with people, I'm gonna be just as aggressive to fight any forms of discrimination, whether that's based on faith, religion, race, sexual identity, education background. There's a long laundry list and it's our responsibility to be as vigilant about anti-Semitism as I would be about racism. So I stand with you. I think that in all of our work, we make sure people are standing against anti-racism, uh, Islamophobia, any form of oppression. But I don't think we seek specific strategies for one single issue, because it's about all of them. They're all connected and they're rooted in the same toxic energy. Pass. Thanks for that, George. There are a couple other questions, but is there anybody else who wants to weigh in? Um, otherwise I can continue on. Okay, so this question says, how might the fact that House Joint Resolution 48, which is moved to amends um, amendment, um, already has specific language, help or hinder intersectionality? Like if we're um, wanting to get oppressed or marginalized peoples to join us, yeah, we already have amendment language, won't that make oppressed or marginalized people feel left out since they didn't help craft that language? Is there a possibility that the amendment language might change to accommodate new ideas and perspectives? Um, so I can say something really quick on this, which is that um, I think this is really important that we be open to uh, information about things that might be left out. But I also want to make sure that folks understand that while move to amends um, base is largely white, middle class, older, that is not who our national team has has been since the amendment was written, at least. Initially, that was true of our of our national team as well, but um, we have actually made sure that our board and our leadership has been at least half people of color for most of the time we've existed. So in terms of who wrote that amendment, not that, that, that any of those folks represent entire communities, but it wasn't just a, a, you know, a group of folks who, well, most of the time when you go to a move to amend meeting, look really different than our national team. So that's one piece um, of being really intentional about how we build the, the, the crew of people who are the ultimate decision makers and where the power lies in the organization. Um, and that's actually something that sometimes we've gotten pushback on in terms of, you know, why are you prioritizing that? I'm doing work in my community on Move to Amend. I should get to you know, help shape um, all of the national decisions. And we've been really clear that, you know, we, we wanna be very intentional about who that national team is um, so that it doesn't just become um, the, the large majority of the folks who are, who are working with. Um, and I would though, um, this person specifically asks about kind of what the other panelists, but, but since they might not know that background, I wanted to kind of give some context for that, but would love to hear what others have to say. And it's not just our amendment, you know, as, as our other amendments comes forward, you know, how, how I think the question applies. How do we make sure that we the people is really who um, crafts this, uh, this language and this law that we're saying should be part of our foundational constitution? Anybody else want to weigh in? 
I could add to that. Um, I, I, th I think it's also important to recognize that the amendment is a tactic and that really what we're doing here is building a movement and um, the amendment makes democracy um, attainable, but what we're really doing is the work of being in solidarity with all fronts of struggle who are affected by corporate power. And um, that includes a whole lot of people. Um, so in addition to what Caitlin said about the actual language of the amendment, um, it's also true that like in our organizing, that's exactly why we're prioritizing intersectionality because it has to be all of us. So the amendment is one tool we're using to recognize that and realize that society, but um, what we're doing is so much deeper than that actually, than the amendment itself. Pass. Anybody else want to weigh in? There's some other questions. Um, I do want to, so the, the comments are set up so that they're only coming to the panelists because some people are talking to us about technical stuff and whatever. So just want to um, acknowledge that Delphine says, um, back to, to David who asked the question about um, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, that anti-Semitism is not the same thing as anti-Zionism and not all Jews are Zionists. For example, I'm Jewish, but not Zionist. And I oppose Israel's Zionist policies that have led to ethnic cleansing and occupation and other war crimes against Palestinians. Um, I think it's important that that comment be lifted up since she meant it for everybody to be able to see, but that's not possible. Um, so let's see, trying to, um, how about uh, somebody, and I didn't catch who asked, um, how to address transphobia in the gay community? Which is a giant question, but anybody want to speak to that a bit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so I'll talk a little bit about it. This is, this could be like a whole conversation that could last like a couple hours. Um, but I think, I think really there are a couple angles that you can come at this with. The, 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 the first most general angle is with any sort of solidarity, any sort of like sort of um, organizing and solidarity movement um, is to sort of have ally, allies uh, sort of up, uplift folks like me, trans people doing the organizing and giving, my, giving me voice to some of the struggles and things that we're, we're sort of dealing. Um, historically, especially from the 80s on, um, uh, men, white gay men, have dominated the conversation um, in LGBTQ rights, um, and, and trans people have largely sat in the back seat. And you can find analogs for this across all marginalized communities. Yep. Um, and uh, it's it's so important for uh, our coalitions to really uplift the voices that need to be heard. So that's like the first general thing. Um, that doesn't apply just to trans community. That applies to, like all the movements that we build. Um, the the second thing um is is a little bit is a larger sort of process of dismantling um the oppressive systems that we have in our society um with respect to uh transphobia sort of dismantling um cisgender heteronormativity um and especially starting you know educating people starting with our youth and breaking down gender norms uh sexual norms and gender norms and and sort of really educating people that it's like all right if like you're a guy but you want to dress more femme or you're a girl and you want to be more masculine those things are okay there's nothing wrong with it um a lot of the source of transphobia is the the breaking of these norms and if we're able to sort of really start at the root of where the cause of these things then then we can start start breaking transphobia uh from uh from the core so there, there are a couple more questions. I think we can take those at the end. And if folks want to continue to, if you have other questions, um, put them in the Q&A. We'll try to get to all of them. But we want to, and also one person asked about resources, and that's actually where we're going to go next. So we're actually answering a question by moving on now. So <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all for putting in questions, being able to take responses, moving forward with the conversation. I know it's not always easy conversation, but it's really important that we have it. Um, so thank you all. So now we're going to get into how can we actually become more intersectional? 
I want to first start by kind of giving a context of the three things that we're going to mostly be talking about today. And again, it's not inclusive of all the tools that exist out there to be more inclusive, more intersectional, um, understand more about anti-oppression frameworks, etc. But we're going to start by talking about how we can educate ourselves um, and each other. And so George from Move to Amend is going to talk a little bit about how Move to Amend works to educate activists who intend to work with communities that are dealing with systemic oppression. So it's about learning privilege, learning um, about you know, your understanding of oppression and uh, where other folks are, where other folks are coming from. And George will go more into that. Then we're going to talk about how to create events that are going to cater more towards communities that have been marginalized by systems of oppression. And I worked with um, Demos in creating a framework. So Free Speech for People and Demos co-released a framework on how to create um, events that center individuals from marginalized communities. And so I'll be going into a little bit about what the framework is about, um, what are some of the information that you can get from it, the critical questions that are coming from it, and some of the conversation that we're going to want to have um, when thinking about how to make these sorts of events. And then we're going to add end with Jessica talking a little bit about solidarity building, coalition building, um, and what that can look like and what that should look like. So I'll start by passing it off to George um, to talk about Movement Education Program. Great, thanks. Wow. So listening to the call and taking everything in, I'm really appreciative of Iraq e and Michelle. It's a lot. It can feel overwhelming and exhausting, but in many ways, this is our work. We want to change the Constitution. It's no small task. And we also, to do that effectively, to win, we need a movement. It's going to take more than those of us who know constitutional law and have PhDs. So, and I don't have either of those things. That means we have to be able to build with people who are different than who we are. And if you come from a background that's traditionally uh, normative in this culture, white, male, middle class, you, you grew up with grew food in the refrigerator and all the bills were paid all the time. To me, that's really well off. So if that is your norm, then building power with people whose experience is different than that is not going to be simple. And to do that effectively, with Move to Amend, we created the Movement Education Program. The Movement Education Program, and Jessica has best, better information than I do about this, but I believe we've got six to nine sessions that affiliate groups participate in. And during that time, you be begin to build a collective skill set. Number one, you're not doing this by yourself. How are we, any of us, going to do it by ourselves? That's one of the basic lessons. We also know that, and this is different than the Movement Education Program. This is George Friday, <laughs> Community Building Philosophy. Once you say, I want to build authentic relationships with people to build power to win, and deal with all oppressions, including my own privilege. We all have privilege. That is the rest of your life. You're not going to do it in a weekend. You're not going to do it by reading a book or going to a seminar. It's every day. It's practice. It's a skill set. That means give yourself and everybody else a break. Because it's the rest of your life. It's not like you're going to get it right. In fact, part of a core piece of the work is figuring out what do I do when I screw up? Not if I screw up, but when, because you will. Um, so now we'll go back to the movement education program, which in my mind helps address some of those George Friday things I just shared with you. So we want at the end of the movement education program for our affiliates to have a solidarity plan that is measurable and accountable so that they'll be able to build power with communities where they live who are getting their asses kicked 
by corporate rule. That's pretty simple. If they can build that power effectively, they will be able to change policy where they are and in time, a half a dozen years or so, get a 28th Amendment. All right, so that's what we want to have happen. We also know that the same kinds of manifestations of oppression that we deal with, I think sometimes people call them microaggressions, happen in all of our groups. So if we have 400 and something thousand people out there who say, yes, I agree with move to amend, we need a 28th amendment, we need real democracy, but those folks are being heteronormative and Islamophobic and anti-Semitic and racist and sexist, how's that helping us? So one of the things we need to do to walk our talk is help groups to move and create structures and systems of power that are truly democratic where they are as they're building this power. We also want in our movement education to highlight lessons from past movements, both what they did well and what they completely fell apart around. So when we look at the abolitionist movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the queer liberation movement, there are so many great lessons that we can learn from. Um, oh, the women's suffrage movement, good stuff there. That's all included in our movement education program which results in a great solidarity plan that many of our affiliates are implementing as we speak, yay. Jessica, can you share any more logistics about the movement education program that I may have missed? Sure, thank you, George. That was a perfect definition of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so the movement education program has changed a lot. Um, it's had several different sort of iterations um, and it changes because we could, like George said, we're never done. So it's always got to change because there's always more stuff we haven't thought about. So it's a curriculum that in its current state is five sessions and it incorporates um, resources about uh, structure and justice within activist groups. It um, includes resources about how these dynamics that we're resisting show up inside both our individual selves and also like our spaces for organizing. Um, and so that's a five session curriculum that a group would go through together. Um, at the end of it, they would come out with two concrete products. One is an internal democracy agreement. So now that we've explored all of these dynamics, how are we gonna operate internally so that we minimize these dynamics and navigate them successfully. Um, the other is an is an solidarity outreach plan. So as George was saying, where's the where is where are the opportunities in our community to collaborate and to work in solidarity and stand in solidarity with groups on the front lines, um, and what does that look like? So uh, these two concrete products come out of this curriculum, and that's the um, sort of internal movement education program. We're also building an online. A program that dive, does a deep dive into these movements. So there's some resources in the five sessions that talk about past movements and ways that those dynamics fractured past movements. But then there's this online version, which is super deep dive into the abolitionist labor movement, queer liberation, and, and those things. So we can um, really study the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Um, so I think that that's also a really important component of, um, of being better is learning uh, how we failed in the past and how also, you know, we recreate the systems that we're trying to um, to resist. So thank you, George, for putting it so well. And um, I would love to share any more, any questions that you have about movement education program. If you have a group of people who you think might want to check it out, let me know. We could help you adapt it for um, whatever you need. And that's all uh, free and, and online. Um, folks to check out at movetoamend.org slash education. And we'll put all of that in the follow-up email as well. Thanks. Thank you both so much for that. So we're gonna jump right into um, the framework that I was talking about earlier. Um, so just talking about creating events that look different than the typical money and politic events. Um, creating events that center folks from marginalized communities so that we can hear their voices and learn from those communities um, as well as working with them. 
So I just wanna talk about first why I think these types of events are important. So I think it's gonna strengthen uh, the money and politics movement because it's gonna bring in more people, including people with invaluable and unique perspectives um, who are often unheard in our political system to begin with. So we don't want them unheard in our movement um, to promote political equality either. And also these events can broaden the conversation um, uh, the money and politics conversations beyond just a discussion around campaign contributions or how much money is spent in, in a campaign to a conversation instead about the concentration of wealth and power in our country. So expanding it to how the issues of money and politics um, actually intersect with other systems of oppression. And so why is this more likely to bring in new audiences? Well, I tend to think that the typical money and politics events can sometimes feel disconnected from people's everyday lives. These events can oftentimes focus on things like the increasing amounts of money spent on elections or court cases like Citizens United um, and maybe some of the donors or the companies that benefit from these systems. But they oftentimes fail to recognize how our big money systems hurt people who have been marginalized by systems of oppression. And so by doing this work, um, we're centering by centering individuals from grassroots organizations who are already working in the communities that we're trying to reach. We can broaden the conversation so that they can connect the issues with money and politics and corporate rights to issues that more directly impact the communities that we're trying to reach, um, to issues that the communities have vested interests in already addressing. So just remember that individuals who experience systemic oppression, they oftentimes have a lot of issues affecting their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so a lot of things to worry about, a lot of things to think about, how do we solve, how do we move forward? Um, so it's, it's important that we're centering their voices and hearing what they have to say um, as well. So I wrote this framework um, in Free, Free Speech for People, co-released the framework with Demos on centering marginalized communities. And so before we get into too in depth of the framework, um, and I'm going to screen share that in a moment too. I kind of want to talk and touch a little bit on um, coalition building just because I think it correlates directly to a full, fuller understanding um, of why these events are important to consider and think about doing the way that we're doing. So finding community partners to work with um, who deal with communities who've been you know, uh, hit by systematic, systemic oppression is not easy work. Um, like George said, it's not something that can happen in an instant. It's, it's a lifetime of work. And it requires uh, folks to be able to gain trust from new communities, to be held accountable, um, to share knowledge and control, and also to boost your own self-awareness. Uh, so you always want to make sure that you're able to listen to other voices and their expressions as it comes. And so kind of going into each of these a little bit more, self-awareness and personal education. George just did a great job talking about that with regards to the movement education program and why it's important to understand your own oppression and privilege. Um, gaining trust is the next one. This is a big one. You have to be involved in the communities that you're trying to reach out to. So you have to go to events. Um, and meetings that are hosted by other organizations that are trusted in the community. And you have to listen to their concerns and you have to wait for a few meetings, most likely, and probably wait for an organizer to come to you and talk to you. And then you can start talking about where you're coming from and what your mission is. And maybe by that point, since you have an understanding of where they're coming from, you can even show how it interrelates already. Um, but I've learned through organizing a rule called the trust model. And the trust model is where you actually end up doubling the amount of time that you expect to spend on a project just to build trust. So for example, if you think a project's gonna take you six months, plan for it to be a year long project and spend that first six months just building trust in the community. And this is gonna help it so that you're not just org asking organizations to support you um, without understanding what their concerns are and finding ways to support them. And, and when you do this, um, you're going to actually, you know, when you're spending time involved in these different grassroots communities, you're going to learn more about the community and you're going to learn more about systemic oppression generally and also how that interrelates to money and politics. So it's going to make you a stronger advocate for the money and politics community, uh, for folks uh, who are marginalized by systems of oppression, and just give you more knowledge and tool, uh, tools as well. 
You also, one thing that's really important, um, George talked about it a little bit too, is you need a willingness to be held accountable. So you're gonna, you're, you're likely to make mistakes and that's okay. And don't feel defensive or if you make a mistake or said something harmful and somebody brings it up instead, we wanna think about what are ways that we can keep an open mind and remember about intent versus impact. And maybe if we didn't even intend to harm somebody, being considerate and thinking about the impact it might have on others. Um, and also, how do we consider some restorative processes that we can set up ahead of time before conflict even occurs that will be able to hold people accountable, but also find ways to heal, learn and grow and move forward from these conversations. So again, just all things to keep in mind when you're building with communities, because um, it's not easy work and uh, it's not gonna be right away. And so just the last thing to consider is make sure to share knowledge and control. Um, and this goes back to the question that was asked. I think that was a great question in terms of our, our people in organizations. And I know it's directed to move to amend, but this could go for any organization. Um, are folks in organizations willing to adjust their missions or their goals based on the input of people of color? And I think that that's really important. It's important to be flexible in what you wanna collaborate on. It's important to find ways to share insight with each other and listen to um, why other communities think that maybe their access to political equality won't be solved with just this, you know, these two aspects or whatnot. Um, so I think that the, these are great conversations to have people already asking these questions and thinking about these considerations with coalition building. So I'm really excited about that. Um, next, I just want to go ahead and move through the framework itself. So I am going to screen share. All right, so this is the framework that I co-released with Demos, Centering Marginalized Communities, a framework for intersectional money and politics events. Again, you can find this framework and most of what we've talked about in this webinar at freespeechforpeople.org backslash intersectionality. Um, so just kind of going through, I just basically wanna take a little bit of time because I know we're, we're running low on time, so I don't wanna spend too much. I'm just sort of going through uh, some of the main points that the framework brings up. And I think first, a really important part is just to recognize that not all communities are the same. And this is something we talked about earlier, so I don't wanna to stay too much on it, but even within communities, there's gonna be privileged and subordinated identities. Um, so with the queer and trans community, um, as Michelle had talked about earlier, white, gay, cis men, um, having more access to you know, the voice and what policies are being promoted uh, for LGBT rights, um, versus like queer, trans, people of color. Um, so just kind of keeping those things in mind. Um, also, the framework talks a little bit here about why it's important not just to have an intersectional panel, but also an intersectional group of people who are actually making the event itself. Um, so, you know, kind of the same concept of you don't just want black and brown actors, but you want black and brown producers because they're going to produce different content. Um, it's the same sort of concept uh, when creating events. You know, there's gonna be questions or different panelists that might, you know, be asked to reach out to that you never would have thought that you would have worked with before. Um, so I think that that's a really important thing. Also, when we're doing this kind of work um, and we're working with individuals, we're trying to center marginalized voices and we wanna create non-hierarchical spaces, we have to think about what can we do because we're dealing with so many power dynamics um, to create a safe space to make sure that all voices are actually heard. Um, so there's some, you know, there's um, some steps, that, some things that you can do called step up, step back. Um, if you look online, there's other resources that you can find on how to make sure spaces are equitable, but just like consider those things when you're, when you're moving forward with these events. Um, so kind of going through the framework, it starts off with providing questions um, and tips for folks who are thinking about just in general these events. I wanna talk about this consulting with community, uh, kind of going back to our conversation around the trust model and around building trust in community. I know a lot of folks are thinking, well, I don't have six months to talk and build. Um, to that, I will say one, it is really important to, to, to make that effort and um, to understand that it's not gonna be an easy task and to you know, try and work with that. Um, but also I know that there are some closer deadlines for certain things, 
um, and you might want to get an event out pretty quickly and you really don't have the opportunity to build that kind of trust. If that's the case, then you should consider maybe potentially hiring a consultant. Um, and so you can think about grassroots organizers who work in the community um, and those at grassroots organizers oftentimes already understand the communities that they're working in. They understand the interests that the communities have. They understand community sentiments around different types of groups and organizations. They also would also understand any interpersonal or political history between groups and organizers, and that could be really, really important. Um, so they can also give you details on logistics, such as the event time, location, and community, which actually brings us to the next point, um, logistics. And these are just some key questions for folks to ask themselves um, when they're when they're uh, creating an event. When we think about who, who are we trying to reach with this event? When we think about where are we trying to put this event? Who's gonna show out when we put this event here versus here? Um, and, and also thinking about when, you know, if you're going to do it during the weekday, um, you know, during lunchtime, it's going to, you know, make it so that, you know, folks who have a nine to five job are gonna have a harder time accessing your events. So just kind of all these questions to consider, again, also with advertising. Um, going to payment, just to take a moment to recognize a lot of grassroots activists that work in communities that are marginalized by systemic oppression are not paid very much and don't and their their organizations don't often have a lot of money. So to the extent that we do have finances and that we can support our other communities, uh, we need to pay them for the labor that we're asking. So if we're inviting folks to be on a panel, um, but we know that these grassroots community organizers are also trying to fight all of these injustices from every other angle, um, you know, just respecting and acknowledging that they're probably going to be run thin um, and that a lot of people might not even be able to make it unless you pay. Um, and so just kind of keeping that into consideration when, when going forward with these sorts of events. Art. Um, actually, Iraq on the call um, is also a uh, rapper, hip hop artist with Foundation Movement and does socially conscious rap. And so I, we, Free Speech for People co-organized with many other organizations, an event on how many politics affects the queer and trans community. And we started with um, socially conscious rap performances by local artists over in DC. And so it definitely opened up the space. It definitely made it less hierarchical. It's really important and valuable to have that. Um, again, we, if you go through the framework, it gives you a little bit of an understanding of what considerations you should have with what panelists you want um, and how to reach those panelists, how to find the right panelists. Um, so more questions that you can consider and you can find this framework online and read it there and we'll send an email after. Um, but just before I stop, I wanted to show that there's also a sample schedule of an event. And so we took that event with the queer and trans concerns on democracy, money, and politics um, and provided the layout of the event for you in this framework. And so you could use that as a starting point for folks who might not have any idea of where to start um, on one of these events to, to promote uh, intersectional events that center folks for marginalized communities. And so it goes through everything from some sample questions to understand the, the crowd's knowledge to sample questions to asking the panelists. It breaks down general theory behind money and politics, political equality, corporate rights. Um, it uh, gives uh, legal theory behind these issues as well, including breakdowns of the court cases. Um, and again, you know, gives, gives some good Q and A's to ask both the panelists and, you know, for opening it up. So that's a lot of the conversation that I have um, around this, and I'm gonna pass it over back to Jessica to just close us off. Um, thank you everyone for who's still on. I know we're three minutes over, but we're just about done. And then we will open it up for questions at the end too. So if folks do wanna stay on, um, great, and ask questions. Um, but if folks need to leave, that's okay, because we have the recording of this being sent over to y'all. Thanks, Jasmine. I just um, want to thank you so much for putting all of that together. I was lucky enough to be part of one of those panels um, in Minnesota this summer at the Democracy Convention. It was really powerful. So thanks for all of that work. Um, when we're talking about this, I think that there's a danger that this gets stuck in an intellectual space. Um, and 
part of the, the goal of this webinar, as you've seen, is providing concrete tools and ideas of how you can take this into action, because it, do, it doesn't do us a lot of good to just talk about it. Um, so coalition building is, as Jasmine is saying, um, a really important component of building an intersectional movement. Um, since there are so many areas of work that relate to resisting corporate power, it's important that the different fronts of struggle are communicating and acting in solidarity with each other. Um, so we could talk for a lot of hours about what solidarity means, um, but uh, we do a lot of that in the movement education program. So you can you can check that out. One way that Move to Amend is building our coalition is by putting together a movement council, which is an advisory body of folks from different fronts of struggle um, who we work with to stay informed and in solidarity and find community or find opportunities to act in solidarity and support each other um, in our different but related work. Um, so there are lots of ways to build coalition and solidarity um, and being explicit and intentional about intersectionality is a really important step. So as your coalition building, um, you know, it's great to be talking to lots of different people, but like, who are those people? And as Jasmine said, who's in decision making power? Power, who's lending their perspective um, so we can we can reach out far and wide but we also have to be explicit about um, making space to welcome voices who are often um, not not listened to in these discussions in a, in a very intentional way so um, the move to amend movement council is currently forming it's really exciting and um, you know, we're, we're always looking for new opportunities to, to build. So, um, you know, this group of folks on the call tonight, thank you so much for, for helping us um, lay this out and, and to Jasmine for your continuous awesomeness. Um, and uh, I, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Do you want me to go ahead and go with an, any questions? Okay. I do just want to say one thing too that folks can do. Um, you know, as Jasmine said, you know, we're talking about stuff that takes time and intentionality. George is talking about skills building, right? So that you don't just get a skill from uh, trying something one time. Um, so we're we're asking to make a commitment and an investment in time. One of the easy things though that can happen right now without a group and thinking through all the stuff is to um, point out when you see that, especially those in the money and politics, because that's who we're kind of, we are here um, assuming, and the amendment community are, are not following through on this at all. Um, and I'll, I'm just gonna say American Promise put together, another organization put together a, um, a whole group of people to talk about what the amendment should say and and none of these priorities were part of the group of people that they built so it was a group of white men mostly with with only a couple people of color only a couple women and when we tried to kind of push and say if we're going to if we're going to start over and say there is no amendment yet let's start over then how can this group of people be the experts to decide and you know that that fell on deaf ears. So it's up to us to make sure that the art organizations that we're working with, that we're representing, that we're part of, are taking this commitment and working it into the work that we do. And so as members of those organizations, that's something we can name. And certainly American Promise is not the only group that does this. This happens all over the place on the left. And so, um, you know, but in terms of amendment groups, that one, I think, is one that we need to pay attention to. So I hope that doesn't cause anybody's feathers to get too ruffled, but I think also part of it is saying what's really going on. Sweeping stuff under the rug or politely pretending like stuff isn't happening doesn't, also, doesn't help this move forward. It actually helps perpetuate you know, white folks who already have power continuing to be the ones who, already, who will have power when we're done. Um, so there are a couple of questions. Uh, one, Susan asks, how can we appeal to young people and get them involved? Students have already made such an impact on the gun issue. So how do we educate them about the rest of these issues while respecting their views and their communities? Does anyone want to speak to that? Um, I have a couple of comments about that actually. Um, so I'll start with a funny anecdote uh, when I answer this question. Um, there was a rally that I helped organize once where a youth came up to me and said, um, I really like your speeches because you dropped the F-bomb a lot. So I'm going to do that now. Um, and generally my MO about youth organizing is I, just to get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> um, 
uh, frankly, the youth, uh, queer youth know a lot more about uh, queer and trans issues than I do. They're a lot of time much more well informed. Um, and really, honestly, uh, in, at least in my perspective, um, it's important for a lot of these movements to uh, have new ideas and new injections of energy from youth organizing. Um, frankly, that's where a lot of uh, a lot of the organizing, the things that we organize around, come from. Um, and uh, you know, I feel like my role is um, mostly uh, when I'm working with youth, mostly just to, to focus them on what they their message they want to get out there. So if I were going to really provide a recommendation about how to uh, really get youth involved, you know, at, talk to them about what really the issues that they're facing um, and just really help guide them to, uh, to figure out what is the, really the best way to get their message across without really being too invasive with what they wanna do. Give them enough autonomy to do what they want to do, but you know, have a soft touch on how they want to do it. Anyone else have anything to add to Michelle's comment? I'll add one thing, um, just as a person who lives in a very multi-generational house, I have a 16 year old sister and a 95 year old great grandmother um, who all inform my work. And I think one thing that we could not do is perpetuate all of these divisive concepts about generations hating each other. Like why are now millennials being pitted against high schoolers, that doesn't make any sense, right? Let's like, let's do this together. Let's listen to our great grandmothers and also listen to the high schoolers and know that like we're on the same team and let's stop perpetuating myths about baby boomers and millennials and you know, high schoolers now, like let's do it together. And I just think those, those messages are just really harmful. Absolutely. Just co-signing that it's an intersectional and intergenerational movement that that we are building here. That's going to get these uh, things passed and and are going to keep our stories alive. Period. Um. Okay. Let's see. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing any questions. I think we might have gotten them all, which is good because I don't I don't think we want to hold people too too late. Um. Did any of the panelists see any questions that I missed? Everybody else can see these chats. And, and you don't have to go back and look. If, if the answer is no, then I think we're good. So Jasmine, do you want to close this up? Yeah, so I just want to highlight that, again, there's a lot of organizations out there that want to do this work and could use some more resources, some more help, some more support, and some more accountability in making sure that the work is done. Um, and that goes well beyond the amendment movement. Um, and well beyond the pro-democracy movement into all of the movements that exist in the world in today's day and in the history. So I just want to thank everybody for holding this space to have this conversation. Um, I know it's not always an easy conversation um, and there's, you know, always some times where we're going to be questioning, is it worth it to go through all of this work? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so keep pushing, let's keep making um, ourselves uncomfortable, but also educated and uh, building a really solid and inclusive movement because that's how we're gonna make this whole nation become better. So thank you all for joining. And uh, if anybody has any um, comments about the webinar, please fill out. We have a comment section afterwards. And again, we're going to send out one email after this um, that's going to give you information for all of our organizations, um, all the speakers that you, you've seen today, their information is going to be provided as well as links. Um, there's been some links within the chat logs, but again, we'll, we'll send that out. And then after that, we're going to delete folks um, emails, phone numbers, etc. So you all have to actively if you want to hear from us more, um, make sure that you sign up for any of the organizations um, that you're hoping to hear from. So yes, give feedback and let us know how we did and what you want to hear more of in the future, what we could do better, um, and what your ideas are for making a more intersectional movement. Thanks. And I just want to take a sec to acknowledge Jasmine for all her leadership on this and um, 
thank you for inviting your um, comrades and colleagues to join us in um, these conversations. And there were a couple different folks who were part of the conversation on Sunday. So we'll include in the email the recording to that too, if you want to tune into that, some different voices kind of speaking to the same thing. So thanks, Jasmine, for your leadership. Good night, everybody. I'm going to shut us down, but please don't forget to give us feedback. Good night. Thanks, everyone.